if you want to look in your Bible with me tonight, let's begin by looking in Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. We'll read a few verses there in a moment. But I want to begin by just reminding you, we all know about Jesus being born via a virgin birth. He was a miracle child, obviously. But did you know in the Bible there is another real miracle child who prefigured Jesus centuries before Jesus ever was born as a babe in Bethlehem? He's a miracle child. He was birthed, you ready for this, by a 90-year-old woman who had been barren for over 70 years and was never able to produce a child till one day a visitor showed up at her door and told her that she was going to have a son. And she laugh, uh, uh, laughed in a mocking way. But however, next year, it actually came true. And her son was named Laughter in the Hebrew. And in English, Isaac. Yitzhak is Isaac. He's a miracle child. And you know, I've been doing some thinking. I guess the Lord just keeps bringing it to my mind about Abraham and Isaac. And uh, I wanted to share with you something about Isaac that perhaps, you know, you've overlooked. Because I think it's very easy to overlook this character. He's, he's kind of diminutive. He's not a very aggressive uh, character in the Bible, this man Isaac. But I think there are some lessons here about him that I, I believe we can benefit from. So let's pause a moment and pray and ask God to just direct our thoughts to them. Thank you, Lord. Your word is truth. Sanctify us by it. Lord, we pray for your saving power. We thank you for the miraculous power that, uh, that brought forth this miracle child. And Lord, we thank you for your mighty power that brought forth our Savior, not only out of a virgin's womb, but out of that borrowed tomb, brought him forth into life again. And because of that, we have life everlasting. Lord, tonight, I ask that you would get glory in our thoughts as we meditate upon these things that you have given to us in your word. And may it have application in our lives, and may the profitability of it spiritually be seen in days ahead. We'll just thank you for your working. We pray this to the glory of the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a few things, three words really, that I think indicate to us something about this man, Isaac. First of all, the word assurance. I had you turn to Genesis 18 because I wanted you to see something here. It says in verse 1, the Lord appeared unto him, him being Abraham, the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And then if you'll drop down to verse 9, it says, they said unto him, that is the visitors that showed up at Abraham and Sarah's tent door, they said to him, and specifically, God was one of those visitors. Two of them were angels, but one was God in a human form. You know, I don't know. I never understand why the Jewish people have a hard time believing that the Messiah could be a human because God had been showing up in, a, in human form all throughout their scriptures. And here is one prime example of it. And so in verse 9, we read, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And, and he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. 
and Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Here's, here's, I, I want you to see this next line, verse 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That's a question you always have to remember. That's a question you always need to keep in mind, especially when you're perplexed or when you're in great difficulty. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, you think it's got to happen now? You think God's got to do it this way? You think it's too late? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. This is what I mean by Isaac and the word assurance. He was the son of promise. It was assured by God. In fact, God gives to Abraham, the father of Isaac, a warranty. You know, most products that come with warranties are very limited, right? Read the fine print, and it's basically meaningless, uh, the warranty that comes with whatever you buy. But God's warranty is absolutely, totally guaranteed. And I want you to see it. In Genesis chapter 15, go back a couple of, of chapters to chapter 15, and I'm going to uh, read with you beginning at verse 2. Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And the reason he said that is because God had promised him 10 years earlier that he was going to give him a son. And so 10 years had passed, and he didn't have a child. And he brings up his servant, Eliezer, who was a servant that was actually born in Abraham's household. And Abraham is suggesting something that was done all the time in that culture, and that is, He's suggesting to the Lord that he be permitted to adopt Eliezer as his heir so that Eliezer, when he had a child, then Abraham could adopt that child as his own child and thus fulfill the promise. That's his thinking. But I want you to see what God's response is to that. Verse 3. Abram said, Behold, thou hast given me no seed. And lo, one born in my house, Eliezer, is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. This is 15.4 in Genesis. Saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven, tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, so shall thy seed be. Well, we could read more, but God absolutely, totally guaranteed a promised son to Abram, and that son would be his own flesh and blood. That son would issue forth from the union of Abraham and Sarah, period. That's the warranty that brings out this assurance that we associate with Isaac. But I want you to see something else. Uh, keep a marker there in Genesis and jump over with me just real quickly to Romans chapter 4. Because while God gives a warranty, ironclad, to Abram, I want you to see this was an impossibility. 
what God was promising to do was a human impossibility. In Romans chapter 4, Paul is talking about how that Abraham was justified by faith. He's illustrating what faith really means. And so if you'll drop down in, in Romans 4 to verse 18, talking about Abraham, he's the father not only of many nations, but he's the father of all who exercise faith. He's the father of faith. It says, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And look at verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God, the warranty that we just looked at in Genesis 15. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, Isaac was a miracle child because, uh, not just because Sarah was barren and beyond childbearing age, but according to this scripture, both her and Abraham's body had no reproductive powers at all. Their reproductive powers were dead. But what we understand is the power of the creator caused their bodies to regain procreative power. And so it says that Abraham believed against all hope, but still in hope, Abraham believed. And that's why Isaac, when you think of him, you should think of assurance. Because here is God giving warranty regarding an absolute impossibility. But there's a second word that I want to associate with Isaac. Not only assurance, but another word, reverence the word reverence. Go back with me, if you will, to Genesis again. And this time, <clears throat> let's look at uh, chapter 31, just a moment. And uh, in verse 42, I believe it is, chapter 31, it's, uh, it's when Jacob was running away from his father-in-law Laban. Remember how he, he sneaked off uh, without telling him? He took his wives and his children and his flocks and his herds and, and he moved out. And Laban tracked him down. Seven days later, Laban caught up with him, his father-in-law, and he was mad. But on his way, you remember, God met Laban one night and gave him a dream and told him, don't you touch Jacob. Don't you touch hurt him. And so they've had some words and uh, it's really tense. And uh, Laban's mad and so is Jacob mad because Laban, he just, he went through all of their stuff saying, this is all mine. You took my, you took my stuff. And anyway, when you get down to uh, verse 42, here's what Jacob says. Actually, drop back to uh, just a, a few verses before that in verse 40. Jacob says to Laban, In the day as I work for you, the drought consumed me, the frost by night, my sleep departed from my eyes. I, I have been 20 years in your house. I've served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your cattle, and you've changed my wages 10 times. And then look at verse 42. I like the way Jacob puts it. He says, except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou had sent me away now empty. 
again in verse, uh, when they make a covenant in verse 53, he says, the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, that is Laban's uh, father, and the God of their father judge betwixt us, and Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac. But I want you to see that phrase in verse 42. It's the only time it appears in the entire Bible where he describes the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac. That is a name for God. God, the fear of Isaac. And it tells us that Isaac was a God-fearing man that Jacob had a God-fearing father. I hope you have a God-fearing father or had one. There's nothing really that matches a father that fears God. That is so important in family life. And Isaac had, or or rather Jacob had a God-fearing father whose name was Isaac. And if you search the the few chapters. There's not a whole lot about Isaac, but if you search the scriptures about Isaac, you'll find in his experience, he was a God-fearing man. And I'm not going to take the time to go there, but I could go back to Genesis chapter uh, 24, where his father Abraham sends his servant, Eliezer, to find a wife. It's an arranged marriage. Sends him back to his uh, brother Nahor's home, Uh, And there, of course, he finds, uh, what's her name? Rachel. Rachel. Finds Rachel. Well, guess what? When Rachel comes back with uh, Eliezer and that retinue of, of camels, and they get back and they see this guy walking through the field. And, uh, Rachel says, who is that? And, uh, Eliezer says, that's that's my servant, that's my servant Isaac. And you know what the Bible says in Genesis uh, 24, 63? Why was Isaac walking through the field? He was meditating. He was a man that feared God, and he was meditating. I believe he was having communion with God. He was a God-fearing man. I could also take you to Genesis 25, where Rachel, she, or or, or rather Rebecca, his wife, Isaac's wife, could not bear children. And so in Genesis 25, verses 20 and 21, this God-fearing man is praying to the Lord and saying, Lord, would you please open the womb of my wife that she could bear a child? And God gave her twins. Jacob and Esau. God answered this God-fearing man's prayer. And I always felt like he messed up big time because he was partial toward Esau. And he wanted the blessing to go to Esau, which of course was culturally the right way, but that wasn't God's plan. God said when, when, uh, Rebecca had these twins that the elder would serve the younger. And Esau, the twin, was born before Jacob. But Isaac tried to bless, he wanted to bless Isaac as the firstborn against God's plan. And I'm sure he knew God's plan. I always kind of had a negative attitude towards Isaac because of that. But I have to go to the next. That happens in chapter 27. He's deceived, remember, by Jacob. And Jacob gets the blessing, even though uh, Isaac wanted to give it to to Esau. But in the next chapter, when Jacob is going to leave and go east to uh, to his uncle Laban's house to find a wife, his dad blesses him, the Bible says. In Genesis 28, 1, Jake, uh, uh, um, uh, Isaac blesses Jacob. And it's interesting that in Hebrews 11, verse 20, that great uh, hall of 
that that uh, of faith that it says that by faith Isaac blessed Esau, Jacob and Esau. He blessed them both. And God commends him for that and calls him a man of faith because of that. And so I would say that that shows that he submitted to the will of God. He obeyed the will of God. He's a God-fearing man because he's meditating, he's praying, and he's obeying. And then in chapter 26, after his father dies, he has this conflict with the herdsmen of the, the, the Philistines. And he, he goes uh, to one of the wells his father dug, and they, they fill it up. And so he goes to another place. He digs a well. They fill that up. But he never is angry. And he's always trying to make peace with these enemies of his. And finally, he does strike a covenant and, uh, that, uh, and dwells there by that, uh, that well. And so he's a peacemaker. And, you know, that's another characteristic of a God-fearing man. He meditates, he prays, and God answers his prayer. He obeys, ultimately, the will of God, even though sometimes we struggle against it. And he's a peacemaker. Isaac reverences God. And he is referred to in, in the words of his son. Uh, it's the, the, the God, the fear of Isaac. That's God's name. Because he feared God. And the word fear in that uh, text actually means terror, to be terror stricken. There is a balance. When we talk about the fear of God, there's a balance between just the, the, the reverent love for God and, the, and, and being uh, terrified of God at the same time. I don't know how it all fits together, but it does. Reverence. He's a man that experienced being a God-fearing father. And look at the influence that he had on his son. You know, whenever the patriarchs are listed, Isaac sandwiched in between Abraham and Jacob, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, using this unique name for God, as I said, found nowhere else in the whole Bible. Not only is he the God of my father, but he is the fear of God, the fear of Isaac. A reference to his dad who lived a life in the fear of God, and that evidently had a was a major aspect of Isaac's character and a trait that others noted and remembered. And this was part of Isaac's testimony that was still remembered and, and lingered in the memory of Jacob, even though he hadn't seen his dad for 20 years. He was impacted by it. And he was impacted by a God-fearing father at a time that he needed God's help most. There's a third word, and this is perhaps, to me, the greatest of all that I think describes Isaac, not only assurance and reverence, but obedience. He was a humble, surrendered son, and this is evidenced in his humble, willing spirit pertaining to the marriage that he let his father and the servant take care of. But I think mostly it's visible in what the Jewish people call the Hakadah, the binding of Isaac. You know, we call it the killing of Isaac, but he didn't get killed. <laughs> he got bound, the binding of Isaac. When you read the Bible in Genesis 22, the Bible approaches that from Abraham's viewpoint. I think you, as well as I, 
have always marveled at Abraham's faith, and, I, and rightly so. But folks, recently, I've been impressed, and, and I say we ought never overlook Isaac's tremendous faith and trust. It's just as absolutely mind-boggling to me as his father's faith. I believe that Isaac totally passed the test that his father was tested in because he was tested too. And I want you to go to Genesis 22 finally tonight. And I want you to see with me, first of all, his humility. Remember, as they got to that place in the land of Moriah, the mountain of Moriah, they saw it afar off. And it says in verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it upon Isaac, his son. I see some humility there. As Abraham places this heavy load to be carried up the mountain, a heavy load of wood, a wood for the sacrifice was placed on Isaac's shoulders. He carries it without any complaint. And it took him three days from Beersheba to Mount Moriah where this sacrifice took place. They traveled three days. And in that three-day journey from home to Moriah, the Bible records only one question that Isaac asked. Verses 6 and 7 as they both went up together, verse 7, Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? That's the only question he asked. His father answered in verse 8, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. So there's no further question. He's satisfied with his father's answer. It says in verse 8, so they went both of them together. That's all he needed to hear. There, there is tremendous humility on his part. But there's a second thing. Not only do I see humility in his obedience, but I see that what he did, he did willingly. Stop and think a moment. What must have been going through Isaac's mind? We can imagine what was going through Abraham's mind. We thought about that. But have we thought about what was going through Isaac's mind as he watched his dad, perhaps even helped him, build this altar of stones? and arrange the wood that he carried on his own shoulders up that mountain on that altar. And when everything was finally finished, it was at that point that it was necessary that Abraham tell Isaac he was going to be the sacrifice. And yet the scripture records there is no argument, there is no struggle, there is absolutely no pushback on the part of Isaac. Total willingness. His father, now, how old was he? No one really knows. But he was at least an adolescent, perhaps in his 20s. Obviously, he had the ability to struggle against an old dad. An old dad that may have been 120 years old at that point. His dad bound him, which means he let him. And his dad stood before him with a knife in his hand and raised that knife to kill him. No struggle on Isaac's part. He is a perfect example of complete surrender of a totally submissive son. He shows humility. He offers himself willingly. He just, he reveals tremendous faith. 
absolute trust in his father and absolute trust in God is obedience. Neither Abraham nor Isaac realized that what they were doing symbolized a proposed sacrifice. God, the Father, and Messiah, the Son, would fulfill what Abraham and Isaac foreshadowed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. And Jesus, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus humbly obeyed his heavenly Father's will and accepted death as your substitutionary sacrifice. It's hard to imagine, like Isaac, being willing to die rather than disobey or dishonor God. And yet, folks, here's the point, and here's the application to you. That's exactly what God calls each one of us to do to die to ourselves. Because in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 25, Jesus, when he's talking about being a follower of his, a true disciple, you have to be willing to deny yourself. You have to be willing to die to yourself. That's what he meant when he said, take up your cross and follow me. Die to yourself. He had a big following, Jesus did, but he turned around and he caused that crowd to thin out because he said, if you don't hate your own life, you can't be my disciple. Luke 14, verse 26. Unless you're willing to set aside your own hopes, your own aspirations, your own goals, dreams, and desires, and choose to fear God, to place your faith in him, to obey him no matter what, to offer your whole life as a living sacrifice to him? The cross is a lonely place. <laughs> Even Jesus didn't pick it up quickly and easily. And he waits for others to pick up their cross. And he waits. And he waits, and he waits.